often or or even in uh, places like singapore and hong kong where people go on beaches or uh, for on the sea there they do have to keep this uh, anti venine for sea snake which is separate whereas the polyvalent anti venine which is which is produced by hafkin institute uh, in parel mumbai that is effective it is polyvalent mean it is effective effective to here to cure to all the four snakes one medicine is there which is effective on any of these four snakes so you don't have to worry that which snake bit you but if you are confirmed that it is a venomous snake then that anti polyvalent anti venine is the best medicine but it has to be administered in a hospital because what happens is after a snake bites a lot of complications arise you know you might get unconscious you might lose your consciousness there is a uh, swelling and uh, there is a uh, you know case of uh, russell's viper sauce killer viper the internal bleeding also is there sometimes so all these issues and for russell's and, so, and cobra and crate there can be uh, you know uh, brief, uh, difficult in breathing you know because it is a nervous uh, it affects nervous system so uh, it affects the heart and lungs and that can cause you difficulty breathing so the patient has to go to the hospital in proper medical care as soon as possible that is the only way you can't treat it at home or in local doctors this proper hospital is very important but yes you do get time it's not that you know this venom is not meant to kill human beings it's a protein and if you drink it and you don't have any uh, wound in your mouth or your uh, uh, on your elementary canal and then you can possibly digest it also like a protein it doesn't give you nasha or any drug it is not some sometime back you know some guy was um uh, held that you know we're selling snake venom for drugs and all you know snake venom doesn't make you high it is just a protein it can kill you if it gets injected in your blood or it comes in contact with the blood system but otherwise you can drink it it's a protein basically so that's the issue so friends i think uh, we have waited enough for people will start now and uh, let's begin with the presentation and let me know when um, uh, you can see it properly okay Let me know if you can see it now. Can you see? Yes, sir, we can see. Okay, great. So we start with herpetology. Hmm? What is herpetology? Now you can see the pictures of crocodiles, snakes, frogs, lizards, and tortoise. Obviously, it's about talking about herpetology is not just snakes. You know, it's it's got the frogs also. It's got a Salamanders also, fro toads, frogs, lizards, um, Sicilians, everything, and it's an interesting branch of zoology. Basically, you know, you can do your PhD, MSc in on this subject. If you are if you are a science student and you want to go study further, you can become a herpetologist by joining any of these um, MSc or master's degree or PhD on the. There are people have done. You know, uh, you can do through uh, Mumbai University. From colleges like you know, and even for institution like Bombay Natural History Society (BNHS) has got seats reserved for MSc and PhD on doing natural history studies. So you, from the, from there, a lot of people have done their MS masters and PhDs on uh, snakes and repti reptiles and amphibians. So you can do it through college herpetology, and uh, it's an interesting um, uh, study if you're really interested. And of course. Studying snakes and reptiles and other things doesn't involve that you have to really catch them. But yes, slowly if you want to, because snakes are once you know what are which are the venomous and non-venomous, then possibly you learn how to catch it also. But later, but first you have to learn how to identify them. That is the first step. Now let's see what kind of you know we have been uh, hearing about dinosaurs and you have seen the T-Rex and other dinosaurs, the the the, the, the prehistoric reptiles. Which we had, and then they, they once once find a the Jurassic Park. You must have seen the movie so many times. So there, the Jurassic uh, those reptiles occurred, and then suddenly they disappeared. Now many people do actually. There are a lot of theories of how the reptiles were once more ruling this earth. Like today, the man is ruling the earth. There was a time when these reptiles were ruling the earth and giant reptiles, but suddenly something happened and they all vanished. And what we now we have the crocodiles, alligators, tauturas, lizards, snakes, and turtles and tortoises. 
that's all remains of this part. but you know if you go to evolutionary history you know the vertebrate life the animals with backbone the first they were in the water like fishes and then the fish came out of water like the today also you go to a, a bank a muddy bank in around mumbai also around places or where the uh, mangroves are there you see this snake come this uh, sorry uh, the fish coming out of water and walking on the land so this is the first fish that actually trying to break the collection of water is trying to come out of water and walking on the land but this is after all a fish it doesn't have a lung it has got a backbone but not a lung it requires lungs to survive on a land so here was a fish that came on the land but it has go back because it, the umbilical connection was could not be broken so let's see what is the next model for this so as you see that the, you know here you see the evolution that the vertebrate life right from the water i was talking slowly slowly it emerged and finally it a uh, transition period was there with uh, amphibian period where little water and little land and then finally it evolved that they can survive on land that that was something like uh, 315 million years ago that that kind of uh, evolution started so first we we'll talk about amphibians and amphibians are one which actually came out of water and they can now hop around but today also frogs are totally they could not break the connection of water so frogs have got the skin which is not water tight it has to remain in the uh, areas where there is moisture is there because that's the reason you see a lot of uh, frogs in the rain so i because the the the, atmo the, the atmosphere around is damp and wet and can survive because their skins require moisture otherwise they'll dry it out and they also remain near water so that was the connection that frogs do they walk on the land they hop on the land but they have to go back even to breed they have to go in the water and their babies are like fish the tadpoles here we have the complex um, life cycle of the frogs uh, you know and the tad tadpoles tadpoles uh, the frog early life is like a fish it has got external gills actually of course those gills disappear later on and they can breathe through the skin also and they have lungs also but that was the first you know an improved model after the fish the fish could walk out of the land but go back it doesn't have lungs but here is a frog that can actually breathe air that was the improvement and but still the water connection could not be broken of course some frogs like the toads have got drier skin most frogs have a moist moist skins and they, they need to remain in a watery environment or a wet environment only the toad can remain in a dry uh, area but not too dry also they they require that kind of dampness in the, air, in the water in the uh, air so here are the some of the and that's the time actually when the frog arrived on the scene on the evolutionary scene the first time the earth heard the voice from a throat earlier there were insects you know chirping and you know, rubbing their body part rubbing their wings but here was an animal that actually the voice came from even the fish uh, didn't make this. the fish also makes now if you have seen fishes like uh, catfish and all that they also can make sounds but they have to rub their uh, fins or from the from the gills sometimes but here was a animal the frog actually made sound to communicate to tell the males that i am here is my territory and to attract the females so here is a uh, bull frog which is uh, blowing its uh, vocal sacs that is the best time to see when the first rains come you should go around the ponds and these frogs usually don't go to lakes and rivers they go to temporary ponds because temporary ponds have less predators a uh, established water body will be have established predators so that will be dangerous to their uh, babies so it, they usually the newly formed ponds actually the rice fields other place where the water is there newly um, accumulated water that's where these frogs breed because they know there there are less chances of a uh, predatory fish uh, snakes and other animals and there are tree frogs also will call from the trees and there are some frogs like this one dancing frog it uses you know why it it calls but the call cannot be heard because they are actually in the waterfall where a lot of noise is there so now it is adapted to actually it it shows one leg out this one leg out as a flashing is like you know to see instead of calling it is making signs here i am here i am you know like when you you, you know you can't you want to talk to a friend and he can't hear you then you try to use sign sign languages so here is a frog is giving a sign language of stretching his one leg that's a dancing frog it's found in the western ghats if you go to amboli in western ghats near um, uh, kudal or goa or, or before goa of course 
uh, Maharashtra and Goa, about Lamboli Ghat is there. There you can see this lovely frog, the dancing frog in the rivulets or the small uh, waterfalls. And of course, frogs, uh, amphibians are, you know, the, you are the frogs are there and they, they are there. Then you have the newts, newts and the salamanders. And then we have another interesting group that looks like an earthworm, but they are not earthworms. They are actually amphibians and they are called the Sicilians without legs there and they they you can always you take it as a, as a earthworm only but no they are and they got eyes and they lay eggs also but they are amphibians and they are found in the western ghats and some they are found in the northeast also and the salamander we have one newt actually we don't have any salamander like european salamanders but we have a newt that is the darjeeling side if you happen to go to sikkim darjeeling you might come across this newt is very rare uh, newt and that is found uh, in, in northeast and then the frog, of course, frogs have got different frogs. We have got um, land frogs, we have got tree frogs, and we got toads, and we got torrent frogs, which actually stay in the um, splashing water of the rocks. So that kind of different adaptation is there. And general, uh, you know, what are the uh, characteristics of a frog? You know, they don't have nails, no claws, so nothing to claw or nail, or, and they have got very, uh, very, uh, very almost. The teeth are almost absent actually they have got a sort of a hard plate which to uh, to crunch you know to the, when they eat the insect they, they can break crunch a very sharp plate is there in their mouth but no uh, um, very minimum teeth are there and they have a tongue of course and tongue is of course very important and it's a sticky tongue and tongue actually helps to catch the insects for the frogs and as i told you the first stage of all the frogs and all the amphibians they have to have a tadpole they don't directly breed from the. There are some species, of course, in the world which actually are born out of uh, the egg straight away as as a froglet. But most of the, the common uh, our the Indian frogs actually have to go under under a sort of stage of being a tadpole, beduk masa. In Marathi, they call beduk masa. It is look, it almost looks like a fish, and it, it lives like a fish in water till it becomes. Then the tail disappears, and the gill disappears, and they start jumping around. And then tadpoles are mainly herbivores. Of course, they, they sometimes eat dead fishes also, or sometimes they eat other uh, uh, things. But mainly they are uh, uh, herbivores. They eat algae and other plants in the water. But mainly they are um, herbivores. And they are basically, uh, you know, uh, ectothermal. Their body temperature depends on the uh, depend on the external sources many times. They can't generate their body heat. Like reptiles also can't generate the body heat. They have to bask. And that's how even um, the frogs also can't generate. And they possibly have to see when the temperature are warm enough, they start moving mainly. But they can actually, amphibians can move much for, in lower temperature also, unlike reptiles. The reptiles have to come out in the sun sometimes and they keep on basking. And too much of cold also make them lethargic. And during extreme environment condition, many of them hibernate in winter or astivate. Like, you know, we, uh, especially in, in drier areas, many times now, after the rains, you wonder where the frogs have gone. The frogs have gone to sleep. And that is a summer sleep. That is astivation. This is a special adaptation. Even crabs also. They go underground. And they go underground in their holes down below. Uh, where there is a slight moisture is there. The frogs also go into slight where there is moisture is there, and they go into a sleep where their body temperature, body activities go very minimal activity. Only possibly some heartbeats they have and some um, uh, breathing they do. Otherwise, the body goes into almost dead. It goes to a long sleep, and when the next rains come, when the water starts flowing, they will wake up and will come out and start calling and getting activities. So that is basically to avoid the extreme temperatures. You know, they can't survive of this extreme of summer and dryness. So to avoid that, they have done. Now, in, even in places where the excessive uh, snow is there, like in Himalayas, many animals, uh, frogs, reptiles, butterflies, they are known to hibernate. And even the bears also are known to hibernate and they go to sleep and they come out when the temperatures warm up. And then they start the activity. That is basically an adaptation to survive these extreme uh, weather conditions. Otherwise, they will perish. Uh, some, of course, some animals migrate. They leave that place and go to warmer places. But everybody can't do that. 
so those who are to stay there they have to go to sleep and avoid that kind of harsh um, uh, temperatures and of course uh, uh, toads and frogs have got this kind of you know a special poison gland that is called of course that poison gland is not harmful to humans as such but basically you must be wondering that toads are very slow moving and as they look very stupid and you know hopping around and you are wondering how they protect themselves but i'll tell you no cat or dog will dare to attack the toad because once in a lifetime they must have tried to attack the slow moving stupid toad but he is not stupid these uh, toads have got a very um, large swelling on the and the on the back and that is that poison gland or parotid gland and that can cause the dogs and cats to froth from their mouth and suffocate they will not die they will remember the unpleasant experience and never again touch the toad that's the learning they get <laughs> even this uh, some of the frogs like had the, the fungoid frog has a warning colors now these colors actually warn the predator to keep off boss mere se dur raho if you touch me you will be you will be regretting and that happens if they try they by mistake they attack and they come in touch with the parotid gland in the back here they have a line a, a linear long line is there which is got the parotid gland and that can cause the dogs or cats to froth even other animals to try to or bird also try to attack these frogs so they soon learn to keep off this and this unpleasant experience they soon learn to identify the color their warning colors so bright colors meant keep off even butterflies also bright colors they are distasteful so birds soon learn to keep off from such animals they are not edible they are distasteful so that's a toad and you can see this um, parotid gland on the on the back the swelling here behind the eye on the back the swelling with black dots that is actually if you press it a whitish liquid comes out and that is the toxin the parotid tax toxin and that can cause suffocation and uh, frothing and almost the, the dog or cat will almost die but near not not die but near there and will will survive and next time it will never never touch the toad and of course there are very sim very different kinds of frogs and frogs are very important ecologically i'll i'll start talk about that also and these are the skipper frogs you know these are the frogs we usually find in the pond and the gutters you know always floating looking for the mosquito or fly to come there and eat there and these when you go near you know what they they skip on the water they don't dive like other frogs the big frogs just dive and go and disappear under the water these frogs skip that's what skipper frog just like when you throw a stone flat stone on the water surface how the stone skips similarly this frog also you know jump tak 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 they jump on the uh, surface of the water that's called skipper frogs very common and most commonly found the um, frogs uh, in the um, ponds and gutters also but now the gutters are so polluted that frogs have gone from gutters unfortunately now uh, once when i was uh, yeah, in school we used to catch frogs in gutters but now the gutters are all all so toxic that nothing is <laughs> nothing survives in that gutter so some frogs are very colorful actually you know there is a malabar flying frog if you happen to go to goa karnataka down south south of maharashtra there are some frogs the, the flying frog and that it is green like this but it has got the red webbing and it's so beautiful frog i don't have the uh, photograph here right now but um, i've seen it in in amboli also and so beautiful frog and uh, uh, that you know it, has, it glides from higher level to lower level with this is spreading its uh, webbing foot so it like a parachuting effect is there so it can it can actually glide from higher level to lower levels and these tree frogs actually don't lay eggs in the pond like other frogs what they do is they go to some branch and some tree or shrub near or hanging a pond or a, or a stream and the male and female generate a foam nest with the secreting the liquid by by the hind legs they keep on churning uh, both moving together and they churn out a, a foam out of the liquid secreted by the female and males and that out of that inside that the the female lays eggs and males also fertilize that eggs and those eggs remain inside that foam ball and that foam ball is there then get stuck to some a uh, tree uh, uh, branch or some drop and it hardens from slightly on the outside but inside is, is moist and usually it happens just before the rains when the rains are about to come and when the rains come the this ball gets detached from the rock or the branch and falls and start moving with the stream and when it falls from in the water the tadpole starts hatching actually 
and that's the time and many times they are already hatched also they're just waiting for the rains and this they, they start emerging from this comb and they get dispersed so that's how it's got it doesn't uh, it lay eggs in the what in the in a standing pool where they already fishes are there to eat the babies or there are other predators to eat the babies here is an adaptation the tree frogs here is a tree frog the common tree frog which is called uh, in uh, tamil actually is called chunam chunam frog also in south india and it's very common frog it comes in the house also it will bathrooms and toilets usually in the summer they come and um, they are usually uh, daytime they sleep like this and nighttime they're out uh, looking out for um, uh, some other uh, insects and amphibians are basically you know are bio indicators they're very important because if they are there that means the water quality is good moment they start disappearing means something is wrong with the water they're the first pe first animals to get affected by the water quality and that is very important so you know these are the telltale signs we have to look for if these animals start disappearing something is really wrong with the environment and they are the first to get affected and these animals just disappear they leave the place it's not that they die they start leaving that place and go to a better place they migrate out we are so dumb that we sometimes stay there and get affected we can't realize the problems of these little subtle changes in the environment and pollution and of course amphibians are threatened because there is so much of pollution the disease because of pollution they get disease also and there is also encroachment in their habitats you know even the ponds and ditches are filled up with water uh, with uh, with uh, reclamation to build uh, houses or anything development so that causes the the amphibian population suffer and so even uh, cutting down trees also and uh, destruct uh, destroy ponds and lakes does uh, cause the population of the uh, uh, amphibians to decline and now we come to watertight skins this is the head of the tokyo gecko one of the largest gecko uh, in the world and i have photographed this in the when i was in assam in the manas national park there it was sitting in a in the forest guest house i was there with our uh, bnx uh, friends uh, members that's the time i found it sitting there and i could photograph it look at the eyes the eyes have got pin holes you know lines because it was daytime otherwise this eyes the eye, eye opens just like a cat it has got a cat like eye so it is because it is nocturnal when it is night the, the pupil opens and too much of light is the pupil contracts into just a thin line so geckos have evolved to be a nocturnal why nocturnal because that way they can survive being seen otherwise most of the lizards are diurnal they are active like the garden lizard and there's a fan throated lizard and there's skink is there they're all daytime they're very active but this lizard is has gone to live in darkness so it can survive and eating insects and can hide from most of the predators and it has got a cat like eyes to actually uh, see in the darkness and then you must have heard the geckos calling chuk 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 in the evenings you must have heard you know in marathi they call pal chuk chukli basically there that is a communication of the of the basically the male gecko is actually communicating with each other and also territorial and that's how they attract each other also communicating so darkness actually you can't see each other so you have to communicate so the voice is developed here for the for the geckos and they can communicate to say that boss i am here so that's a very interesting and geckos have got so many adaptation i'll tell you more as you go so this is a lizard and now we have come to water tight skin we were in frogs where the frogs didn't have water tight skins but now we come to reptiles reptiles have water tight skins we are coming to reptiles and here you see a uh, brussels viper the venomous snake in the and the man is there cutting the paddy field and that's where these are found and can cause problem but they are also important in rice field because they control the rat population they are very expert in eating rats they can go inside the hole of the rats and catch them so that's also important but yes farmers know these hazards and they usually keep a good watch on the snakes scales i was talking about water tight skins that's what you see in this reptiles is the scales you know reptiles have got scales and snakes lizards and crocodiles they have different kind here you have the snakes uh, uh, skin with the, the keel in the slightly the, uh, the scale is slightly keeled in the uh, in between then there are very minute small uh, scales of a of a lizard possibly a day gecko the andaman day gecko and then a crocodile uh, skin you see and then you have the uh, uh, tortoise um, uh, uh, leg here with those uh, scutes reptiles are the first vertebrates to live on land actually you know 
frogs were there but frogs had to go back to water the water connection was not broken and there you have the presence of claws they have claws the frogs didn't have claws so they have claws so you have an improved version of now you know the reptiles are improved version of over the frog and they have claws and their bodies covered with scales so they they become watertight and they breathe with lungs that is very important now they don't have to really breathe to skin like frogs but they can breathe through uh, uh through skin uh, through lungs and they are oviviparous basically this uh, is uh, some are actually give live birth like, like the vipers give live uh, birth vipers and boas give live birth as most of them leave eggs but eggs also uh, are not uh, uh, don't have a cover like a, a chicken egg hard solid they are leathery so there the eggs have to actually remain within a, a place where the slight moisture is there so slightly the water connection is not clean broken but here to certain extent they are trying to break so the eggs are there but eggs require a moist environment to uh, to hatch and they are usually buried under the soil to so they remain hidden and they remain moist and but of course there are some as i said like the wine snake green wine snake and then we have sand boas and then we have vipers they give live birth live birth is advantage because you don't have to lay eggs and legs eggs might be eaten and be destroyed so here the female carries the young ones inside the, the eggs inside the body and the young ones hatch inside the body and then they are born so they are called oviviparous bird uh, this snakes and almost all reptiles uh, are cold blooded except leatherback turtles are there which can possibly to regulate their body temperature which is some degree it is known that leatherback can possibly regulate their body temperature otherwise almost all reptiles are cold blooded so they are, if they want to increase their body temperature they have to go and bask in the sun they don't like we have a constant body temperature our temperature is uh, remains constant for not for them so it depends on the environment the environment is too cold they become cold is too hot they become hot so for if they, if they want to cool down they have to go in the shade or they will go in the water or they want to uh, warm up they have to go come out in the sun and bask so that's important and sensory system you know like vision now here they can actually have good sight they have good eyesight and uh, like i said go geckos have got a, sp a special night vision so they can see in the uh, darkness also and they have movable eyelids except uh, except snakes and geckos they uh, don't have but other lizards have got uh, movable eyelids but snakes and geckos don't have movable eyelids and then you have sensory system hearing reptiles are different ways of hearing sound waves you know they have tympaniums like in the as you see here in the geckos you have the uh, this ear here the lizards usually have this ear snakes don't have this kind of uh, opening instead they can detect the vibrations you know like we have been seeing this uh, nagin uh, music on the uh, hindi movies you see the sapera you know playing his bin and the snake moving but snake moves not according to sound but actually movement of the bin you no know, and not so that everybody knows about that now but so that's how snakes actually can detect the presence of a of a person coming or animal coming by the vibration on the ground so they can sense that through their bones in the jaw whereas other lizards have got this kind of um, uh, tympanium or the ear is called inner ears and they can hear through that so that's how they have developed uh, to to receive sound waves and of course the folk tongues of many of the reptiles especially snakes you know that's a special actually it's a sensory organ to collect smell particles from the air so that's how they smell we smell from the nose but here they have to specially make an effort to the the, the tongue actually flicks almost voluntary involuntary flicks and it collects uh, to detect odors and that's how it can come to know what exactly is going around snake can actually detect whether the the prey is there or there's something to eat around or some warm blooded animal is there and some have got even sensory pits like the pit vipers the russell's viper they got and pythons have got extra sensory pits uh, above the no above the uh, upper lip that means they can actually get a thermal picture just like in the war they have special uh, you know sensory um, uh, devices to get a thermal picture of the enemy coming or thermal picture even <laughs> some of the heat seeking devices have got thermal pictures so similarly your snakes also like the pit viper the pythons they can get a thermal picture of the prey with a small prey a warm blooded prey is coming so how big it is there how small it according it will strike so getting a thermal picture is not something which is 
the man has invented, but it was already there with the snakes. Now we come to crocodiles. This is the largest crocodile we have in India. It can grow up to 30 feet. And this is the saltwater crocodile. This was in uh, Sundarbans. I was there in Sundarbans. In winter, the best time to go to Sundarbans is winter because that's the time the crocodiles come and bask. And you can go almost 10 feet and photograph this lovely crocodile there. And they don't attack, actually. They're very docile. Of course, unless you don't want to fall in the water. If you fall in the water, then I don't, I don't know what happens. But so far, you're in the boat. You're safe. Otherwise, there's a large crocodile. It can fall <laughs> too large. It can grow up to... We, this was around something like about a 20 feet a crocodile. A very large one. And then we have muggers. Muggers are there in, in Mumbai. Like we have the freshwater body. Uh, like we have lakes like Tulsi Lake or Vihar Lake. We have muggers. And even on the on the coast of Pomkan and Goa, there are these muggers. They actually occur in the, in the, in the estuaries where the rivers uh, meet the sea. But they are not saltwater crocodiles. There are no saltwater crocodiles on the on the western shore. You get saltwater crocodile only in in uh, Sundarbans, West Bengal, and Odisha. There are two places where you can get the saltwater crocodiles. Otherwise, nowhere else. So that's a mugger. And then we have gharial. Gharial is also another uh, endangered crocodile which is called. It has got a ghara. You see, this is a male and it's got a knob on the top of its uh, snout, and it's a male and it makes sound actually. The male when it's mating, it, it's in 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 the mating calls actually to call females, it, it gives a sound of in and it gets a resonation of this in the ghara of the snout. And that's how it uh, uh, attracts the females. That's a male I photographed in, in Corbett National Park in the Ramganga River. That's a fish eating crocodile, mainly it doesn't attract uh, attack human beings, and it was one of the most endangered crocodile we had in India. But uh, luckily, the forest department have bred them in captivity in Chambal rivers, other places in in in, in Ukrail, in Uttar Pradesh, and they have bred them in captivity. And they have the, the special release pro hatch and release program is there to bring them back from the um, endangered status. And then we have the ghorpad or the monitor lizard. But this is the water monitor, not the ghorpad that the Tanaji used to climb Kondana Fort. This is the water monitor. It grows very large, and this I photographed in Sundarbans, of course, and that's a blessed uh, Sundarbans and Odisha. Uh, Odisha, the, there are two places where you can see this uh, water monitor. Very large, it becomes almost six feet, it can grow. It can it basically needs mainly fish, crabs, anything that can, and other uh, snakes and other lizards. It can eat whatever it can, bird eggs and bird young ones. And it is a very um, large predator. It is, it is a relative of the Komodo dragon. But not as big as a Komodo dragon, but yes, this can be the largest it can grow among the other monitor lizards found in India. The, of course, the common monitor lizard, the Ghorpad, that is found in Maharashtra also, that, that grows about something like a meter long. And it is today, all these um, uh, Ghorpad, the monitor lizards, are protected under the Wildlife Protection Act. Because once upon a time, there was a big industry of you know killing these lizards and extracting the leather. And there was a huge leather market in the foreign countries. And they were exporting them, smuggling also. But now that is stopped. And now this is protected under law by the Wildlife Protection Act. Just like tiger and lion, even the lizards, monitor lizards are protected. Even pythons are protected. And king cobra are also protected. Now we come to geckos. Pal, palli, chipkali. And look at the leg here. This is the special pad they have that can actually defy gravity. So you must have seen the geckos uh, climbing on the ceiling or even the glass also, steel, it can climb because of this. And if you see under a microscope, it looks like a Velcro. They are basically tiny Velcro hooks. So a Velcro is nothing new the man has invented. It is basically a copy of this pad only, which the gecko has on underneath. And this is a bark gecko found on the bark usually. Not the house gecko, but it's a bark gecko. And there's another gecko, it's called a ground gecko. If you're trekking in Western Ghats, like Mathiran or uh, Sayadris, any places, Mahabaleshwar, other places, you might see this ground gecko in Amboli also. And this ground, ground gecko will not have these pads because it doesn't require the ground gecko. It doesn't climb up. It stays on the ground. So that's the difference between a ground gecko and this is other geckos. But geckos are all nocturnal usually. There are day geckos also. If you go to Andamans, there's a beautiful green gecko in Andamans, and that's called the day gecko. And that is not nocturnal, but diurnal and beautiful gecko. And that's a fat-tailed gecko that's found in Rajasthan, Gujarat, and even Odisha also. 
and that's another uh, beautiful gecko often sold in the pet shops also and people have been uh, using it for laboratories also for uh, for uh, studying genetics and breeding them for other purpose but that's another very interesting gecko that uh, people have been keeping as pet also and this is the fat tail gecko because you know it stores the fat in the in the tail so when it hibernates or when the food is available the uh, the, the energy is utilized from the tail to survive till they get the food because they sir they usually live in places where it's very dry and arid so there the food is not always available so that's why they have whenever they have extra food it is, it is stored as energy as a fat in in the tail and they are very uh, nice cute fat tail they have got this is a fat tail gecko found in uh, dry areas of india and here I, i was talking about this uh, um the pads of the gecko that can that can make them walk on the ceiling and defy gravity but you see the orange uh, specks here actually those are the, those are the mites these are the mites the, the parasitic mites which are often found in the reptiles and uh, geckos and um, they uh, too much of them can can cause problems for the geckos also they can't remove their parasites though they eat insects but removing parasites is difficult but you can see the claws also of the gecko you know the close up and these are the pads that is the pads which can help them to walk on the smooth surface so that's a gecko the the house gecko the common house gecko and these are non venomous none of the lizards of this house lizards are non venomous and they are even if they fall on your body or they bite you nothing happens that day in insta actually I, you will be surprised in insta i was watching one lady chinese lady eating this lizard you know dipping in a sauce and eating but of course living is aside it is even if falls in the food and it gets cooked nothing happens the people say are chipkali gir gayi or food poisoning no no doesn't happen that way even my cats eat the lizards and my chicken also eat the lizards nothing happens to them and they are totally non venom non venomous and doesn't have cause any food poison yes if your food has got some other problems like they, they are not they are cooked in copper vessel which are not tinned or there are some other uh, if the food is stale or something that can cause problems but not because of lizard and many of the lizards when they lay, lay eggs they they come together in a safe, in a safe place and they often live to uh, they lay eggs in a safe place so is a colonial nesting ground for the nest and these eggs are adhesive they stick to the surface when the babies hatch many of the shells you see they are empty but uh, they, they if a female finds a safe place other female also come there and will lay eggs and and that's how two three females will using the same spot to lay eggs because they find it a safe place and these are adhesive eggs so it doesn't have to come to the ground and lay eggs and dig a hole like a, a garden lizard it comes on the ground and digs a hole and lays eggs and then bury it and go that that problem they, the geckos don't have they just go in a some safe place hidden from the man just lays the adhesive and goes off the eggs eggs get stuck there and hatch on their own so gecko is much advanced lizard than most of the lizards and here you have very fantastic beautiful uh, lizard we have the fan throated lizard of course now there are several species of this lizard the fan throated lizard and when the breeding time especially in march april we go to satara and other is pune near pune uh, dry areas this lizards when each lizard will be occupying one rock or one uh, area and will be displaying it and many of the photographers had gone crazy actually photographing this beautiful lizard of displaying the sitana called sitana or the fan throated lizard and the males are very territorial and each male will be fighting with other male not allow another male to come and that's very interesting and they are very not all species of this color the different species some are white uh, dewlop but this uh, species have got a very colorful dewlop and an amazing uh, display you can see very tiny this hardly a 6 inches lizard not even 6 inches 4 to 5 inches lizard is there small lizard now it looks big but it's not that big and then we come to snakes now that's a longest non venomous snake the indian rock python and rock python are very common actually found where the water is there even near mumbai in sanjay gandhi national park you still find um, pythons and there are pythons in around navi mumbai also some places you can see them and we have a, uh, our project site in ambivali there also the python was located there so pythons are still seen there and they are endangered and they are protected as much as tiger and lion killing a python is a grave crime and person can uh, land up in jail if you are just killing a, a python for just for for the skin or something and then you have a relative of python it's called the sand boa it looks almost like a russell's viper see the pattern the pattern is very irregular it is not regular pattern i'll show you the russell's sand boa later on but here you see and it doesn't hiss the, the russell's viper will hiss it looks fat like russell's viper but it is not russell's viper 
and it is very conical tail. The tail is very conical and short. It is totally harmless snake. People often kill it, thinking it is a venomous uh, Russell viper. It is not venomous. The pattern is irregular. And that's uh, and sand boa lay uh, give live birth. They don't lay eggs, but uh, live uh, babies are born to this uh, female. And then we have the smallest snake, that is the Brahmi blind snake. It is very small as as an earthworm. You might even mistake it for an earthworm. You know, this is the first snake actually I caught when I was a school um, boy. I saw this. I used to catch earthworms and keep them in a the bottle uh, and keep them as a pet. Once I saw one earthworm-like thing wriggling in the summer, in the middle of summer. And I almost I ran to catch it, but the neighbor's, the neighbor's wife saw me and she ran and caught me hold and she said, no, no, this is not, uh, this is something else. He said, this is sap hai. And it was really a snake. It was the blinds, though it is harmless, it is non-venomous. But yes, she was right and I was stopped from catching this snake. <laughs> I thought it was earthworm. That was the blind snake, the earth worm snake, it is called worm snake also. And worm snakes actually are all females. There is no male sometimes because sometimes the male and the females don't meet and that's called parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis means females give birth to females and that's how they procreate. Sometimes the males and females can't meet. In that case, the female will give birth without the presence of male. And they are just replicas of the mother. And then we have the tree snakes. You know, the snakes have been adapted to survive on on trees also many times because they can't all snakes can't live on the ground and there will be too much of competition so i adapted here is a bronze back tree snake it is an expert climber and a very swift snake and it goes after geckos and birds small birds and um, lizards and it stays on the on the tree only and can climb up like we have the uh, other beautiful snake is the all the golden flying snake i don't have a photograph here but it's another beautiful snake which also climbs on the tree and can glide actually it can jump from a higher layer to lower level by flattening its uh, belly and it gets the parachuting effect. This snake doesn't glide, but this is expert climber. And it's a venom, it's non-venomous snake. I'll show you the venomous. These, what I'm showing you is all non-venomous snakes now. And that's a uh, um, bronze back tree snake. We have a very beautiful snake, long, slender snake, always found on trees, and can climb on a tree trunk also, vertical tree trunk. It's got special scales on the side of its belly. Then we come to striped killback, nanety. Marathi is called nanety. It is said that if you kill one nanety, seven nanities appear. I said, it can happen. Yes, it happens. Why? Because during the breed, during this monsoon, there's a breeding time. And many times a female nanety is chased by seven eight males. So people have been trying to kill one nanety, suddenly they have seven eight appears. You know, they keep, they disperse. They think are ek, ek marne gaya to to pragat ho gaye. You know, all these myths have been lashed up with this uh, magic and because we had madaris also to 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 encourage such kind of myths but actually um <laughs> somehow snakes and uh, snakes also have been part of the cult animals unfortunately like like uh, bats and black cats and other things but uh, this snake, snake is totally harmless and in breeding time the female one female is chased and coated by seven males that's how people say ek marega to sat pragat ho jayegi and it's a very common snake, especially in the just a, a beginning of monsoon, you see the snakes in the rice fields and the grassy areas. And now we have the common wolf snake. If In fact, this uh, I had photographed and this is my hand actually. <laughs> it, it, it comes in the house actually here. I'm staying in Karjat. And it comes in the house for search of, in search of uh, lizards and can climb walls also. And, and it looks like a uh, venomous crate. But the difference is the crate will never have a band on the back of its head. This band, it looks like crate looks like this also many times, but this band is absent on crate and the head is flat. Of course, you know, learn slowly. You can't say yeah, how you can remember this, but yes, you have to practice it. Even I have to, whenever I catch a wolf snake, I have to see properly that this band is there. Otherwise, I might end up catching a crate and that can be dangerous. So I'll never catch a crate. You give me a lakh of rupees also, I'll never catch a crate. So there's a wolf snake, harmless snake, and it's got a band on the back of its head, in the neck region, and that's how it differs from the Great. And this is basically a lizard eating snake and it will come to the houses. Usually it comes out, it comes in the wall, it can crawl on the wall also, climb walls and have and strings also and branches also. And basically it remains hidden during the daytime, nighttime it comes. It's very common in the areas where there are thatched houses and roofs are there to hide. 
and then we have banded group, another beautiful snake it was photographed it was caught in uh, navi mumbai actually kopar khairani region this is a banded kukri very beautiful snake again you see this mark shaman this v shape mark on the back basically uh, this wolf snake you know will why it is called wolf snake is basically the teeth the front teeth are slightly larger like a wolf that's why it's called the wolf snake lycodon the latin name is lycodon and uh, the wolves that's what it's called wolf snake and um, the kukri has got a chevron like a uh, chevron like mark here like the v shape mark on the back and the teeth are like a kukri the gurkha kukri slightly curved um, on the uh, top uh, from the uh, near the tip so that's like a kukri uh, knife so teeth are like a kukri that's what it's called name is banded kukri there are several varieties of kukri species and of course you know getting a uh, a non venomous snake bite nothing will happen to you a blood will come will draw but then it's totally harmless you don't have to worry about it but yes you have to be sure that it is a, it is a non venomous snake a venomous snake means you have to anyway any snake bite you have to go to doctor to see that you are suffering a reaction otherwise uh, this is a, a, a striped uh, this is a, a checkered keel back young one and getting bitten by a venomous non venomous snake is totally harmless nothing happens Many times people go to uh, this uh, mantriks and jadoolas, and they come to know that this is a harmless snake, and they try to pretend that they are uh, know the mantra and they have the magic. Nothing. It's just a psychology that basically works. But a venomous snake can kill person. Yes, it can. Green wine snake. It comes to green wine snake here. The, of course, it Marathi is called harantol, and they believe that it it sits on the tree and it hits the human uh, man's head. It always uh, bites on the top of the mad hen only, and man dies. Nothing happened. That the pointed head is very soft. It is slightly venomous, but not the venom is not to kill human being. It is very mild. It only can kill a small bird or a frog, but not a man. And they are rear fang. The fangs are not on the front like a uh, saw scale viper or a cobra. Then the back, and they are rarely uh, the the snake. The venom is not fatal to human beings, but yes, they are mildly venomous. And when they are angry or they are alarmed, they will actually display and try to mock and try to scare you away. You know they know they are not that strong, but they will try to appear dangerous just to scare you away because they don't they don't want confrontation because then confrontation possibly maybe loss of life. So best thing is to scare away the predator. That's the best way to uh, get away. That's how a, a wine snake will display. See the colors actually. The, the colors now you can don't see the color. The moment it gets alarmed, it will show the color. The intra scales, the skin expands and shows the color. Then we come to common cat snake. The cat snake is eating a lizard here, and you can see the cat snake eyes here. The eyes is like a cat. The, the pupil, you see the pupil expand. It is a nighttime photography, and it is eating a, a lizard. And here you see the the Y shape mark on the top of the. It looks like a saw scale viper, but it is saw scale viper is very short, and it remains huddled on the ground. Whereas this is a slender, long snake, and it usually doesn't stay on the ground as such. That's the difference, and it usually stays on the trees or rocks. But it comes in the house sometimes to eat lizards, basically, and it has got a Y shape, inverted Y shape mark on the head. Of course, now we come to cobras. This is the cobra. That's in a striking position, and then cobras, when they are uh, scared or alarmed, they'll spread the hoods. They want to look dangerous and and warn you and scare you away. If you are not scared, you will try to come and forward. They might bite you. Yes, they will bite at the last resort. Otherwise, they'll hiss. They'll hiss and they'll spread the hood and try to scare you away. And then we come to on the right. That's a saw scale viper. You see the this uh, arrow shape mark here. And the cat snake, there was an inverted Y. Here is arrow shape mark. And this snake will not usually climb trees or any big, big, and it very is not slender or long. Whereas this is much shorter, though it can be slender but not long. And it will always remain on the ground. And it doesn't hiss, but it it rubs his body scales to make that hissing sound, the sawing sound. That's how the the, the you know keep on they keep on moving and rubbing the body part, uh, the bodies to make that uh, sawing sound of the scales. And you can hear, you can hear the hiss. Whereas Russell's viper here on the left, you see the round spots here, and it can hiss like a pressure cooker when cornered and alarmed, and give you enough warning. And when you're very close, they will strike, and they have very long teeth to inject the venom. Possibly among the venomous snake, this has got the longest uh, uh, fangs. 
Of course, uh, pit vipers also have got fangs, but uh, Russell's viper have got long fangs and they remain folded in their mouth. When they have to strike, the, the, the fangs open and that's it and they, they strike. And that's a crate again, the, one of the most venomous snake among the fours. We have the cobra, Russell's viper, sauce crate viper and common crate. Now, common crate looks like a wolf snake, but I told you the difference. Look at the head region. There is no mark on the head region. The head region is totally abs is totally blank. The, these, these bands are there on the body, but not near the head region. Whereas wolf snake has got a band in the head region. That's the difference. But yes, both wolf snake and uh, common crates come out in the night. And that can be dangerous. And usually they are very docile. But you, by mistake, you know, many times in the winter, they come out uh, in the house. They come out in the house and they, for warmth, they might go and sleep uh, near a man sleeping on the ground. And if you, if you turn and you try to crush, this snake gets crushed, it will bite. It has happened that people have been found dead in the morning. So that is possibly some of the crate bites. And because it might take, it is very, very, the snake, the venom is very potent. It will possibly kill a man within four to six hours if you get a good bite. And that's a nervous uh, neurotoxin. It affects the nervous system, the heart and lungs. It's like cobra. Then we have the pit vipers. You have to try, uh, trek to Mathiran or for uh, Ma Mableshwar or any of these hill stations. Even Sanjay Gandhi National Park, even, even uh, Taloja Hills also you might see, especially Mansoon, you see the pit vipers. And there are special pits here. The, the, these are the depressions here about the upper lip. And these are actually heat sensory pits. Just like Python and Russell's Viper also have their heat sensory pits. They can actually sense the presence of a warm-blooded prey or animal. And accordingly, it will decide whether to strike or to avoid. So they can they can get a thermal image. And these pit vipers are actually venomous, but the venom is not strong enough to kill a human being. You know, human being is much larger. So the venom is not venom. But it can cause problems like you can possibly get a bad swelling or even gangrene also at times. It is not properly treated. So best thing to get properly treated, even if there's a um, uh, this uh, pit vipers bite. And there is a uh, the ground pit viper, the hump nose pit viper actually remains in the ground. When you are traveling in the north, in the western guards in Goa and down south, you might see these brown pit vipers, the hump nose pit vipers on among the dry leaves. That doesn't sit on the uh, trees like this. But this is basically arboreal. It is a tree dwelling uh, viper. And as I told you that snakes smell with their tongue. So always a flicking of tongue is basically collecting the smell particle. That's how it comes to know what who is it around or what is the, the prey around is there or what's a, a, or a predator is there and they can get a sense. Besides the eye also, I also can see but the smell also is very important. So importance of snakes, of course, you know that snakes are ecologically important because they actually keep the rodent population control and it's also part of the food chain actually, you know, like the, the entire ecology of what they, they are also, uh, snakes are also eaten by birds, other animals like mongoose and owls and other, uh, like the serpent eagle, they eat snakes and snakes eat the frogs and rats and that kind of ecology goes on with the with the frogs eating the insects and in, frogs are eaten by the snakes. So that kind of, um, and of course snake venom is very important and it is used in some of the important um, as a, in medicinal uh, medicine, especially because you know the viper venom actually affects the human blood so it has got that uh, blood uh, coagulate, coagulation uh, or blood thinning properties are there so that can be used for this kind of uh, uh, towards so they are used and the cobra and crate has got uh, venom that affects the nervous system so they are used for that kind of medicines and further research. So there is, these are actually very, the venom is much more expensive than gold many times, the dry venom. And it is important. And as I said, it is not a drug. It can, can't give you the high that, that a drug can give. It's basically protein that you can actually swallow it and digest it also. But venom is used. If it comes in contact with the blood, it can cause problems. But venom is used in medicinal purpose also. And it has been used in, in, in several higher researches. And of course, snakes keep the population of rats in the field in control. And of course, now we come to turtles, the tortoise turtles and terrapins. Yeah, that's a sea turtle. And sea turtles are basically, you know, they, they remain. We have, of course, uh, uh, our coast, especially in the months in the Mumbai coast is terribly polluted. But yes, there are turtles sometimes on and off. Earlier, they used to come and breed there also, lay eggs also on the governor's beach. But now they're stopped because there's too much of disturbance. But yes, if you go to uh, many of these uh, Konkan region and they have the turtle festival also there. 
where the turtles come and lay eggs there and they uh, bury the eggs and then the turtles hatch and that's and there's a special festival in uh, in Konkan region where they release the turtles so that's uh, interesting and turtles are endangered we have uh, different species of uh, marine turtles including the leatherback also leatherback is found mainly in andamans and nicobars but uh, that's important and they actually the presence of turtles actually tell you that that the ecosystem is healthy it's a keystone species actually and this is the turtle the olive ridley turtle i was in andamans and we were we, we we were told that the female is going to come and lay eggs so we were all waiting we, they said don't go now because she'll get scared and she'll go back so we were waiting and when then she came and then we all gathered there and we watched the female dug up the hole and decide laying eggs she laid about 102 eggs later on these eggs were collected by the forest department and taken to a safe place for hatching but then she actually tapped the egg she, she covered the sand and she tapped the uh, total sand out uh, to see that you can't make out where the eggs are there and then she went back to the sea i uh, went back to the sea that's what uh, this was photographed in andaman islands where we were watching this actually happening in front of our eyes the sea turtle and then we have the freshwater turtle this is a soft shell turtle we have uh, the turtles with a hard back is there and there are uh, soft shell turtles are there like these and they are all in some of them are very much endangered also of course there are some places in in northeast other places turtles have eaten but now turtles are brought under protection and catching and killing turtles is it totally banned in india earlier there were turtles were smuggled from punjab to northeast into the market to be sold as fish today now they are banned actually that's a there's a freshwater turtle and we have this is the called the the flap shell turtle is very common in the field and rivers and small lakes sometimes people put them in the well also but actually not, they should not be put in the well because uh, they can't breed in the well you know for for them to breed actually they require a sandy shore or a muddy shore in well they are prisoned like it is like a dungeon for them they can't breed them and they can't bath them also they can't come on the rock and bath so keeping turtles in the well is actually a wrong thing it and they say it, it cleans the water it doesn't clean the water it they eat non-veg and other fishes and other things they don't eat uh, kachra and then we have tortoises that's a star, star tortoise once upon a time it was a very popular pet in everybody's house almost but now it is banned and it's it totally prohibited to keep it as a pet this occurs in in south india of course in andhra pradesh and in tamil nadu in dry areas and then you see them in gujarat rajasthan these are tortoise and they are totally vegetarian mainly vegetarians and they lay about two eggs in, in a in one year that's so why the population is very low but now the government has protected we actually they were smuggling this tur turtles via pakistan towards europe and towards uh, gulf uh, but now it is totally banned and of course major uh, you know major threat to the reptiles of course one is of course the road crossing many snakes get uh, run over by the cars on the roads that's why you have to if you're a, if you're a car owner please ensure that you you, you take care when driving last uh, last week only i i found one chameleon walking on the crossing the road luckily there are no other cars because chameleons can't run they walk with two legs uh, two steps ahead and one step behind two steps and that way it was walking so i quickly got down from the car caught that chameleon and released it in the, in the nearby shrub so that's the thing and the plastics and other pollution is causing problems with this and the nets fisher nets getting stuck in the uh, uh, their necks of the turtles and causing problems you must have seen on the instagram also and in, in the facebook also the how the turtles are suffering because we are throwing everything in the ocean that's our problem and that is causing problems myths and superstitions about turtles where people sometimes uh, kill turtles or the bury turtles and the so so many uh, problems are there and here are some of the common frogs you can come across uh, when you uh, when when the monsoon comes you have the indian bull frog and we have cricket frog and they are tree frog then we have the skipping or the skittering frog and a burrow burrowing frog which burrows in the ground and then a common toad once upon a time actually india was exporting frog legs you know we were getting dollars and big companies like britannia were actually uh, uh, involved in selling the frog legs and exporting frog legs to japan and uk and then they found out ki the rice growing area like karjar areas yeah, the rice field rice crop is suffering from insect invasion and they found that the frog is missing where is the frog gone and they found that the frog has gone to europe frog has gone to japan and then uh, bombay national society did a uh, research for 3 years they told the icar uh, indian council for research agricultural research give us 3 years to prove that frogs are more important than rice fields and for 3 years they worked on the frogs and they found out that frogs eat 
four times their body weight the harmful insects found in the rice fields and finally government was convinced and they brought a total ban on the frog legs export of course we lost dollars but we got our frog frogs back in the rice fields to control the pest species which the pesticides could not and pesticide don't kill insects they kill the they kill us finally so frogs are very important in rice fields than in the export market that government of india realized and frogs were back in the duty so frogs are very important to control harmful insect population especially in the agriculture and of course we have lizards like the common skink then we have the brooks gecko then we have the chameleon then we have the garden lizard then we have this small snake skink or supple snake skink and then we have the common one these are all lizards are totally harmless and non venomous do not to worry none of the indian lizards are venomous and then we have some other cobra that's a snake like spectacle cobra checkered killback when non venomous cobra is venomous indian rat snake is non venomous then the russell's kukri is not russell's viper russell's kukri are harmless the russell's viper is venomous look at the pattern the chain like pattern and the round pad and here is another snake sand boar that looks often mistaken for russell's viper but look at the pattern compare this two they are so different one is harmless and one is venomous the russell's viper is venomous and sand boar is totally harmless so that's how um, um, this and finally what is what is basically is uh, dangerous to uh, threatening and what is affecting this population of wildlife is a loss of habitat you know losing habitat is a major threat to all the wild animals and wildlife so what we have to protect is the forests and the habitats if some of the forests and habitats are protected this future will be better for this animals birds and insects and if they remain secure we remain secure because forests are very important forest as said jungle nadi ki maa hai forest gives birth to rivers and fresh water and we require fresh water fresh water doesn't come from pipes to a tap actually fresh water comes from the rivers and from mountains and the forest and then the lakes and the lakes from wahan se pipe mein ghar aate so imagine fresh water without you know the city without fresh water we we'll have to leave the city because city like mumbai there is a lot of sea water around no fresh water so that's the reason we have to protect the forest because forest actually give birth to fresh water and jungle nadi ki maa hai you have to remember that and we have to protect habitat just not for snakes reptiles butterflies and other insects but for our future and here you have i show you crocodile again why you know because this crocodile was present when dinosaurs ruled earth it's it was there when the dinosaurs was total power big big giant reptiles were ruling the earth and then finally one day something happened and all these dinosaurs just vanished crocodile survived today the crocodile is watching us actually and it is watching the man the man ruling this earth the man has taken us the place of dinosaur only thing the difference between man and dinosaur is that ki man has got the intelligence and brains that the dinosaur didn't have possibly man will realize that it has to take the care of this earth and look after this precious earth otherwise they will also go like dinosaurs and the crocodile will still watch us thank you friends so this is basically the way of life we have and we have to take care of other animals because we are possibly the intelligent race among the other species and we know that this is our precious earth we should not risk because this is the earth we have borrowed from our from the next generation we have to give them to our children in good shape otherwise they'll blame us you didn't take care of our earth this is not ours we have just borrowed from them and they have to we have to give them in good shape so let's give a better earth to our children thank you friends any any uh, more questions you can ask me now yes you can ask me if you have any questions or any doubts and you can always write to me i am on the facebook and i am also there on the website you can write to write to us yes shan you are there yeah you were there last time also and you wrote to me yes <laughs> so thank you friends i am sure you enjoyed this um, little introduction to the reptiles and amphibians i hope you um, learn more and uh, read more and maybe you go out start going out and 
watch them. You know, watching um, uh, snakes and reptiles is not easy actually. They are they are not easily seen. They are very secretive. So you have to keep on going out. And it's not that they are come out all in the night also. They sometimes you see them daytime also. So keep going. You might see them. Okay, Shan, you want to ask something? Yes, Shan. You can unmute yourself and you can. You want to ask something? Yeah, you can. Uh, yeah, you can put it here. Yeah, okay. Write down what you want to ask. So basically, yeah, yes, so you did not. Um, like I was in Mathiran once, you know, night night time. People say don't go in the night, and you will. Uh, there are no snakes there, but we 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 are, we are climbing the uh, Mathiran mountain in the middle of the night. Nothing, not a single snake we saw. Yeah, what Shan says that there are a lot of people who act as snake rescue, especially in our Mumbai, who specially show off uh, the capture. Yes, there has been a problem with this so-called snake rescuers. And of course, the forest department had recently taken action on these uh, snake rescuers, and they had also issued passes to people who are really a genuine snake rescuers. But yes, snakes have been um, used to you know people who want to show off, and many times these people have been badly bitten also by because they try to show off. You know, many times uh, we have seen Insta also and other places also where people have been bitten on their faces and um, lips by trying to kiss a venomous snake. So that, that can be a kiss of death. <laughs> but yes, people have been using snake, so-called snake rescuers. So that the even forest department is aware. And recently, they had actually issued certain passes to certain people with certificate that they can possibly go for a rescue. But other people are totally banned and it is illegal to catch snakes otherwise. Yes, they have done that. Yeah. So friends, do um, spare two minutes to fill the feedback form so that we can get a feedback and we can do a better programs for you and uh, welcome and thank you for uh, joining this program and good night and enjoy your weekend thank you so much i'll take your leave